Hello. Uh, great. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm Dr. Jonathan Eskinis. I'm a uh, assistant professor of politics at the uh, here at Catholic University and fellow at the Center for the Study of Statesmanship. Uh, this event on uh, whether America's foreign policy is compatible with Christian ethics is brought to you by the Center for the Study of Statesmanship and Institute for Human Ecology. Uh, and the intention of the event is to delve into an area often neglected in discussions of foreign policy. Not questions of prudence and strategy, but questions of what's right and wrong. Uh, and especially uh, what's right and wrong in the context of uh, Christian ethics and the, the Christian tradition of thinking about uh, war, diplomacy, and international relations. And we've got really some of the best people possible here to have this discussion. Um, we have uh, Mike Desch. Uh, Professor Desch is the founding director of the Notre Dame Inst uh, International Security Center and the Packy J.D. Professor of Political Science at Notre Dame. He's published in a number of prestigious academic and popular journals, most recently with an exchange in Commonweal Magazine about the Catholic Church's position on nuclear weapons. Uh, and next to him is Dr. Paul Miller, who's a professor of the practice of international affairs at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security, and currently serving in the AEI Initiative on Faith and Public Life's uh, 2019 and 2020 visiting professor. Uh, if you like what you hear, Paul is teaching a chorus on Christianity, national identity, and America's role in the world at the AEI Summer Institute for undergraduates. Uh, applications due February 24th. Uh, and our moderator for tonight is Tim Carney. Uh, Tim is a resident fellow at AEI where he works on economic competition, cronyism, civil society, localism, and religion in America. He's also a columnist at the Washington Examiner. And he has a recent book out on Alienated America, Why Some Places Thrive While Others Collapse. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. We're very uh, lucky to have uh, Professors Miller and Desch here. Very uh, grateful to have you, you guys as a crowd here. And if you heard from my introduction, I am, I'm not a foreign policy expert. I am a, a Catholic who, uh, who cares about foreign policy. So I'm here to interview these guys. I spent most of the night trying to work on just the right sort of with a Georgetown professor, a Notre Dame professor, just the right Jesuit joke. I couldn't get any cleared by my priest, so <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start with that. But yes, it's it's exactly right that uh, uh, Christian ethics, Catholic teaching, the the words of the Bible, the words of Jesus, um, have a lot to do with the United States' role in the world, with war, with peace, with our duty to our neighbors. Um, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. He very explicitly said, my, my peace I leave you. Um, very explicitly made it clear that our duty to other people is not just to those in our country, but to those around the world. So it's, a, uh, it's not an easy question, which is why we're very, uh, we're very lucky to have these, these two scholars here tonight. So the, the sort of first question I have to both of you is Christian ethics, what does it tell us about what the United States ought to be doing and is doing on foreign policy? And we're going to start with uh, Professor Paul. Th thanks, Tim. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks to John. Thanks to all the organizers to Catholic University. Thank you to you all for your time and uh, giving us your time and attention. And I hope uh, we make it worth your while tonight. Um, Christian ethics and American foreign policy. It's a great subject. Uh, I've been um, trying to think and write about this for a long time. Uh, when I looked at tonight's event, uh, Mike and I have not actually met each other before tonight, but I did some research, and I, I just, I just want to say thank you to John for finding two people who really don't agree on anything. So this is going to be a, <laughs> it's going to be a great conversation in contrasts. Um, I'll start with the one thing that perhaps we do agree on, uh, and that is, I think this, uh, Christian political ethics begins with the idea that governments have a moral duty, a moral duty, to seek the safety and the well-being of their citizens. I think it's a true statement. I presume we probably agree on that. Um, where we go from there is where things get interesting. It's where you try to apply that and say, how do you go about securing the, the safety and the well-being of your citizens? Um, let, me, let me begin with a sort of a reflection on Reinhold Niebuhr, right, the patron saint of Christian realism. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr is a favorite uh, from sort of all sides of the aisle. Everybody loves to cite him and quote him. Um, <clears throat> Barack Obama said it was, uh, Niebuhr was his favorite philosopher, and uh, John McCain also quoted Niebuhr in favor of the Iraq War. So you can find Niebuhr to support <laughs> everything. Um, here's what I found in Niebuhr. He, 
uh, was talking about the nature of realism and contrasting realism with <coughs> Christian realism. And in an essay called Augustine's Political Realism, he contrasted his approach with, um, he called the realism, in quotes he put it, the realism of those who are myopically realistic, myopically, short-sightedly realistic, by seeing only their own interests and failing thereby to do justice to the interests where they are involved with the interests of others. All right, so Niebuhr was saying, channeling Augustine, that sometimes our interests are not simply ours, that our interests and other nations' interests are essentially the same, and we can't pursue the one without pursuing the other. And it behooves us to be cognizant of the ways in which our interests are intertwined with much of the rest of the world. He goes on and says this, a consistent self-interest, that is to say narrow self-interest, on the part of a nation will work against its interests. It'll be counterproductive because it will fail to do justice to the broader and longer interests which are involved with the interests of other nations. So we have short-term immediate interests. If we define our interests very narrowly, that's one thing. But if we pursue only that short-term stuff, we're gonna miss out on the broader long-term interests that involves the rest of the world. He says, a narrow national loyalty on our part will obscure our long-range interests when they're involved with those of the whole alliance of free nations. And so I agree with Niebuhr in this. I think that when we define our national interest, we should understand the ways in which our interests are the same as or overlap with much of the rest of the world to the extent that we should pursue the good of the whole and not define our national interest very narrowly um, in a, in a short-sighted, short-term way. Okay, what do I mean by this? What's the best way to kind of boil this down to brass tacks? Uh, here's the bumper sticker. The liberal international order is an effective tool for pursuing the safety of our citizens, the well-being of our citizens. The liberal international order is an effective instrument for pursuing a just end, the safety of our, and the well-being of our citizens. The liberal international order is the outer perimeter of American security. It is an engine of American prosperity. It's a tool of American influence. And as such, it is just and wise for us to use it and invest in it. I'd say the same thing for pretty much any other country in the world. It's wise and just for any country to invest in this order because it's founded in principle on fairness and equality among nations at its best. I know that we sometimes get that wrong, but in principle, it's founded on fairness. And therefore, a Christian realist political ethics should say that American foreign policy um, should revise, defend, upkeep, maintain, and use the liberal international order as a cornerstone of our grand strategy. And that means Christian political ethics su suggests a strategy of deep engagement, of um, a fairly active foreign policy, a well-funded and well-staffed diplomatic corps, uh, a, a large foreign aid budget, a network of alliances with countries that see the world the same way that we do, that we have overlapping interests with. And yes, it does mean, I think, a globally deployed military presence to deter rivals, reassure allies, invest in partnerships, train foreign militaries, provide disaster relief, and more. It is wise, it is just, it is ethically good, and it is strategically sound to do so. Now, I know that usually when I say this, I've been making this argument long enough, I know the re rebuttal. The rebuttal is Iraq. The rebuttal is Vietnam. Um, or sometimes the scholars say, this is just a cover for American empire, for liberal hegemony. So I'll save my rebuttal. I, I do have a rebuttal for that, but I don't want to take up all the time. I'll save that for after Mike makes the argument, and then I'll dive in with my uh, rebuttal on that. I just say I'm not persuaded. I don't think it's imperialism. There is a difference between real imperialism and, what, and the kind of liberal order building that I'm talking about. I think I want to conclude with a couple of questions. Um, given what I've sketched here, uh, and, I, and I know that you generally, disagree, I, I'm going to guess, disagree with most of what I've said, um, here's a couple of questions for you. I know that you've counseled uh, retrenchment uh, or pulling back or exercising restraint. As I look at the data, I've found that we have already been doing that for about 30 years. Uh, the United States has a, has a smaller presence around the world today and a smaller military budget, a smaller intelligence and, and, and diplomatic budget and foreign aid budget than, uh, than when the Cold War ended. The Iraq War was a pretty small, actually, sort of temporary blip and we're back down again. So my question is, um, when, when do we stop retrenching? Uh, at what point is it enough or can we stop retrenching now and kind of hold the line to take stock of where we are given changes in the world environment? <clears throat> Second question would be about the democratic piece. 
Uh, if, you, if you didn't hear it, the democratic piece is very much there in how I understand the world and the liberal international order. Uh, I understand it to be essentially a true theory. And so I question, I just ask, what about the democratic piece? Do you acknowledge that it's real? Is it a good, useful tool for policymaking, as I think it is? And my third question is. I thought it was two questions. So, <laughs> I, I, one last one. Please, I'm done. Yeah. Third question. Given the record of the past 75 years of liberal order building, past 75 years of great power peace, of, of unprecedented prosperity, and I'd even say of the expansion of freedom around the world, not just in the West, not just in America, um, what's wrong with this? Uh, how, how can you counsel that we divest from this project? And what is the alternative that offers a, a, a superior version of justice than what we have today? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great, Paul. Uh, those are terrific questions, which I'm not going to answer. <laughs> uh, I, at least because I, I thought I got an opening statement. I mean, is the yeah, rule of law completely uh, eroded? Yeah, we, we, we still have a rule of law in America. Yeah, let me, uh, but we, we will come back to them uh, because they're uh, terrific questions. I have a question for you, um, but I'm going to wait and right. do, it, do it at the end. So <clears throat> I want to, the, the question I posed for myself is uh, whether realism and restraint uh, are compatible uh, with Christian ethics. And the Christian ethics I care most about are uh, Roman Catholic ethics. So I'm going to focus on, uh, on just war theory. And I want to make two points. Uh, first of all, I think, uh, with all due respect uh, to my colleague, the practical case for restraint uh, is open and shut. Um, and it's not just uh, Iraq, although Iraq is a big part of it, but uh, just talk about uh, the past uh, 20 years of US foreign policy. Afghanistan, which I supported uh, the initial intervention after 9-11, classic example of a good war uh, gone bad, a war that was justified given uh, the Taliban's harboring of al-Qaeda and the necessity of um, uh, you know, dealing with uh, al-Qaeda uh, militarily. But somewhere along the road to Kabul, uh, we went from uh, taking care of that limited and focused problem to uh, nation building. Nation building in a nation that had never been a nation uh, at any point in history. Iraq, Paul, I can't believe you're going to defend Iraq. Oh, I'm not. I mean, that we, no, went, we, we went in on the uh, uh, belief that uh, Saddam Hussein was pursuing uh, a weaponized uh, nuclear program. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming that he was not. The only interesting question is why he didn't fully come clean about that. We went in also on the insinuation um, that the Iraqi regime had meaningful connections before the invasion uh, with al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda became a real big problem, and subsequently ISIS after the invasion, uh, but not before. The big winner uh, of our toppling of Saddam Hussein was the Islamic Republic of Iran. And if you believe, as I do, that uh, maintaining a balance of power in the Persian Gulf uh, is in the interest of the region and in the United States, absolutely the last thing you would have done uh, would be to knock over a key check um, on Iranian uh, or on Iraqi uh, or Iranian uh, influence in the region. But finally and most importantly, the human cost uh, of our operation in Iraq, uh, not so much uh, for the United States, although the fact that uh, over 5,000 uh, American men and women in uniform uh, gave their lives in a war that I think ultimately was misbegotten uh, is a national uh, tragedy. But the human cost on the people that we went in to liberate uh, has been astronomical. Libya, the real uh, Hillary Clinton scandal in Libya is not Benghazi. The real scandal was her belief initially um, that we could social engineer the Arab Spring um, in, uh, in Libya um, uh, and uh, turn that country into a uh, democracy basically on the end of a bayonet. Um, and then finally, Syria. Um, and Syria I, was the case I expected you to uh, push harder. 
But it seems to me, even in Syria, the only thing worse than the Basar al-Assad regi uh, regime, which is an odious regime, no doubt about it, is what was highly likely to follow him uh, if he was overthrown. So I think the uh, uh, practical case for restraint uh, is easy to make. The hard case, and the one that I've come here to the godly precincts of Catholic University, from maybe the less godly precincts uh, the, uh, of Notre Dame, <laughs> but certainly the more godly precincts than Georgetown. <laughs> Granted, we and, agree. We agree. <laughs> and, and I say that. We have as, the ranking agreed to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and I say that as somebody who was Jesuit educated at the uh, the, the uh, late 70s, early 1980s. So I know, I know Jesuit uh, education <laughs> pretty well. But the, the argument that uh, restraint and realpolitik um, is compatible with the Roman Catholic uh, tradition of thinking about war and peace, uh, I think is a harder sell. Um, and I see the sisters out there, they're already sharpening the knives. And they'll, they'll tell us uh, quite rightly that- since Nobody has sharper knives than the sisters. They, so. Exactly, exactly. When they came, got on the bus and came out to uh, South Bend, I. Uh, I took notice. Um, since Vatican II, the church has veered toward a, uh, a position, at least in terms of war and peace issues, uh, that's increasingly uh, pacifistic. And indeed, uh, even before that in the 20th century, that was the, church, uh, the direction the church was going. Think about Pope Benedict XV uh, and World War I. Uh, or think later um, in the early Cold War period, uh, the founding fathers of what would become the European Union, uh, people like Robert Schumann, Con Conrad Adenauer, uh, Gasperi, um, were all animated by a deeply Catholicly uh, infused uh, vision of international politics that seeks to overturn uh, the world of realpolitik um, that uh, I'm advocating for. Now, my argument. Uh, restraint, um, which uh, Paul and I are going to argue about, is deeply uh, infused with realism and realpolitik. Um, our genesis story is Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, and the classics illustrated one line summary of that is uh, Pericles, the great Athenian leader, uh, was an advocate uh, of restraint. Uh, his successors, especially Alcibiades, um, were uh, ambitious uh, uh, proponents of uh, a aggressive foreign policy, the Sicilian expedition uh, is basically uh, the low point of the story. So what realism basically says uh, is four things. First of all, uh, it's interest uh, that defines how states interact with each other in the international system. Uh, power uh, is the key uh, interest uh, that states have, and very few areas of the world directly affect the balance of power. Secondly, uh, we believe that states in anarchy in an unor or disordered international system find it to be in their own interest most of the time uh, to uh, take care of their own security. Sometimes we need to help them, but most often what we need to do is avoid the moral hazard of doing too much, uh, which produces instances in which allies don't provide uh, sufficiently for their own security. Third premise is the most powerful ism in international politics from the realist view uh, is nationalism. Um, and nationalism, the idea that uh, particular forms uh, of social organization uh, dominate the world uh, teaches a powerful lesson, which is anytime you intervene in another country, um, you're gonna run up against it. The final presumption is uh, a healthy respect for uh, the limits uh, of even great power. And the United States, um, since the end of the Cold War, has been one of the greatest powers uh, history has ever seen. But even a power uh, of that magnitude uh, is incapable uh, of basically uh, socially engineering the world. 
Um, more importantly, there's a domestic cost uh, to uh, ex bestriding the world uh, like a colossus. Lord Acton once famously said that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I think a lot of the story uh, of the past 25 or 30 years or so is not just going to be told in terms of our misadventures uh, abroad, uh, but also uh, what our imperial uh, stance has done uh, to our republic um, here at home. So just very quickly, and I'm getting the, the hairy eyeball uh, here, um, how could this view of the world uh, be at all um, compatible with uh, Roman Catholicism? And I've already said that uh, Vatican II uh, seems to fit uncomfortably uh, with the Christian realist view that I've tried to lay out. But if you want to see uh, a really uh, full-throated uh, attack uh, on this enterprise, go back and read uh, the French philosopher Jacques Maritain's uh, famous essay, um, The End of Machiavellianism. Um, and if, Mer if we were to uh, you know, uh, raise the spirit of Maritain here, uh, he would say two things. He'd say, Professor Desch, your realism will lead leaders to do evil, um, and it'll produce a bad policy uh, for your state. And I'd make the argument, and I'll unpack this in uh, more detail in the Q&A, that I think uh, the experience of the past 25 to 30 years uh, have suggested precisely the opposite, um, that, uh, in fact, a restrained foreign policy has led to a better foreign policy for the United States defined uh, in narrow secular terms. But I also think that it's uh, also, in thinking about interest defined uh, as power, ironically not led le uh, leaders to uh, engage in the sort of evil um, that absolute Machiavellianism uh, would bring about. So I said I would uh, wrap up with one question uh, for Paul. And, and the question is, why do you grasp the realist mantle at all? It seems to me a liberal internationalist argument uh, is uh, compatible with certain parts of the tradition, at least of the Catholic view of international politics, um, and also uh, has uh, it, its own deep roots in American political culture. Um, but why did you feel the need uh, to tie what strikes me as a classically uh, big L liberal argument uh, to uh, realism? So with that. You can answer either the question he just asked or whatever you think is the most interesting thing. So I can just say whatever I want to yeah. now. That's great. <laughs> uh, I feel like a candidate stumping, you know. Yeah. Answer the question I wish you asked. <laughs> Um, I think I will probably go ahead and take up uh, your, your question there. And I, I'll take up yours, too, at some point. Yeah. Just tell me um, when. Why, why claim the mantle realism at all? Um, partly because I do think that my argument is actually empirically grounded. I think I'm actually paying attention to the facts. Facts like the democratic piece, which is, I think, very empirically grounded. And based on that, it leads me to think of alliances a certain way and investing in relationships a certain way um, and upholding NATO, for example. Um, but it's also because I want to recognize the importance of drawing limits. Oftentimes when you hear an internationalist argument like mine, it is framed in universalistic utopian terms, and it sounds as if the person is saying we ought to go and conquer the world in the name of saving it. And I recognize that's a bad thing, and we shouldn't do that. Um, realism, uh, in, as, as I've packaged it here, helps us draw lines and know when and where to invest around the world. We should be cautious, we should be prudential, we should be realistic in how we try to go about our liberal order building. I do think it's a worthwhile project, I think it's realistic because by the way, for 70 years we've been doing it with some success. So that says it's possible and therefore we should keep on trying to do it and just do it better. Uh, there's nothing unrealistic about the liberal international order. It, do, it already exists. So let's just upkeep it and improve it where we can. So your, your first question to me, which I thought was uh uh, eminently fair one, which is, is basically words to the effect of uh, how much retrenchment uh, yeah. would, would you accept? Um, and, and I'll turn that question around on you, Paul, and say, 
I've given you a, uh, a list of uh, many of the greatest hits of the uh, uh, new millennium in terms of wars uh, and you know, uh, made my judgment on those. Uh, what's your judgment uh, on them? And is there a war that we fought uh, in that time period that uh, in retrospect you thought was a mistake? Yeah, uh, thank you. So I look forward to your answer to my question at some point. Um, <laughs> but but the, so I am not at all going to sit here and defend the record of the U.S. foreign policy in the last 25 or 30 years. There's plenty that has gone wrong. and We actually may agree quite a bit on the critiques of American foreign policy. We're going to disagree on what exactly what went wrong. Uh, but yeah, it's fairly plain the war in Iraq was wrong. Uh, Full disclosure, I did support it at the time. I've written a case study of it in my next book on just war theory and uh, have concluded that um, while I think the initial cause was morally permissible, it was ultimately obviously a failure, but also unjust in execution. Um, I, so plenty has gone wrong with American foreign policy in the last 30 years. I think the main problem isn't too much liberalism. In fact, I think it's probably too little. I think we've failed mainly in not living up to our liberal ideals. And sometimes the failure has been a failure of engagement. We just haven't de dedicated enough uh, resources or effort or attention to actually make the things happen which we say we want to happen. Uh, you know, you, you brought up Syria. I think Syria is a great case study of restraint. This is what happens when America does not get involved. We, we've barely done anything in Syria, and it has built state failure uh, and a terrorist uh, a recruiting ground. So that's a good case of what restraint, I think, leads to in some cases, not always, but in some cases. I want, I want to bring this back towards Christian ethics, Catholic teaching, and just ask what I hope is a, a, a difficult question here. We can look at the problems that arise from our war in Iraq, from our intervention in the, in the Libyan Civil War, and that we could imagine would happen if we deposed Bashar Assad. But we Catholics believe that there are sins of omission and sins of commission. And the, the Obama administration argument for the intervention in Libya was we knew that they were going to go door to door, killing the people who, murdering the people who oppose Gaddafi's regime. And so we had an obligation to stop them. So when you're preaching restraint, are you preaching let's leave Gaddafi and Saddam and Assad in power? And to what extent is there moral culpability for the evils and the murders that those dictators impose if we have the power to stop them from committing those murders? Yeah, I think that's a, uh, a great question. Um, al although uh, I, I'm sort of, uh, I'm, I'm very curious uh, about the uh, particular uh, tradition of Roman Catholic thought where the uh, argument of what's basically in the secular version R2P, the responsibility uh, to protect comes from. Uh, I guess- Or in the words of uh, Spider-Man's Uncle Ben, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Although uh, when responsibility became coterminous uh, with uh, profligate use um, is no. a in but interesting- uh, Go on about the responsibility to protect. Yeah, I think uh, there are lots of instances uh, around the world um, where governments uh, are doing uh, horrible things uh, to their own people. Um, you know, the 20th century was, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the nadir uh, in terms of that. Um, but yet, did anybody well, some people did, I guess, early in the Cold War, who were advocates of preventive war against the Stalin Soviet Union, seriously think uh, that a, uh, a, a war uh, to uh, end the uh, humanitarian crisis there uh, made good sense? Was anybody arguing during the, the uh, Mao period, another great mass murderer, uh, that there was any reasonable uh, scenario in which the United States would intervene um, and stop that. But more importantly, let's look at cases where we have intervened um, and uh, where things uh, have not gone very well. And I think uh, Libya is a, a good case of that. 
I think Iraq is an even better case. The human cost, you know, we don't really know for sure uh, the full cost uh, of the, uh, the war um, in Iraq, and certainly not all of the Iraqis who died died as a result uh, of American military operations. So I'm certainly not insinuating that we went in there with a callous disregard uh, for uh, the lives of the Iraqis. But nonetheless, you can't conduct modern military operations in a surgical way, particularly given the way the war in Iraq turned out. It's like the old line in Vietnam uh, about the uh, major saying, in order to save the village, we had to destroy it. In order to save Iraq, we killed lots of people. The moral economy of restraint, it seems to me, comes precisely uh, from the possibility that in a lot of cases where you use military force, you can't predict how it's going to turn out, but you can predict that lots of innocent people are going to get killed. Paul? So yeah, let's talk about Iraq. So um, Iraq uh, was a mistake, right? It was an imprudent, wrong use of force. Um, but uh, I don't think Iraq was a paradigmatic case of U.S. foreign policy. I think right now we, almost all of us, are falling prey to recency bias, where the most recent data point is seen to be the most important data point, and because Iraq looms so large in our consciousness, we have a tendency to look around the world and look in history and look in the future and to see Iraq-like problems all over the place. I think that's actually what uh, afflicted the Obama administration, and it's why they did not intervene in Syria. They've said it actually very plainly. It was because of Iraq. And I think it was, um, it was faulty thinking. I may actually agree with the decision not to intervene there, but it was faulty thinking about um, wh why they did what they did. Uh, were you about to say something? Well, I, I, at, so, at some point, I, I would love to uh, hear you uh, articulate a uh, plausible strategy in which through American intervention in Syria that we both got rid of the Assad regime, um, but we did not bring to power uh, groups that would have been as bad, if not worse. And you, I were, don't, you weren't suggesting. No, I was you were I, just saying, yeah. even if it's the right conclusion, it was faulty. Faulty thinking, think, thinking yes. yeah. Better example would be Afghanistan. I think the faulty thinking about Iraq led to bad strategy in Afghanistan as well. I don't advocate an intervention in Syria, to be very clear. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm relieved. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me, I'll get back around to that. Um, you know, again, Iraq, not a paradigmatic case of US foreign policy. Most of what we do in the world and most of what liberal order building involves isn't invading other countries and forcing them to be democratic. Most of what deep engagement uh, would involve is a more active foreign policy um, that involves things like uh, all the tools, normal tools of statecraft, more aid, uh, more trade, more development, uh, more trained diplomats, uh, more language training, just a more active presence in the world. This is the sinews of diplomacy. This is the normal wheels of statecraft churning. And you need to know, we've been cutting back on that for 30 years. Our diplomats, our State Department, our USAID are starved for money and for talented people. They need more of it, and we've been cu cutting back and retrenching consistently. If you're wondering why we do such a bad job in places like Libya and Syria, uh, and not just there, but Somalia and Yemen, and uh, take your pick, it's because for 30 years we've been divesting ourselves of the tools required to actually do something meaningful there. Our foreign aid budget is, uh, I think it might be down to one-tenth of 1% 1 of GDP. It's, it's unbelievable how small it is compared to the Marshall Plan, which is about 2% of GDP. We have unilaterally disarmed ourselves of one of the most effective tools of statecraft. That's, that's what retrenchment really looks like. We've decided not to spend the money on doing those kinds of things. Okay, now that, uh, I, I, I don't think I can, uh, can let pass. Uh, I, by the way, uh, agree with you on the substantive issue. I, I believe in international engagement. Uh, I like diplomacy, um, and uh, uh, unlike many people in the Midwest, I even like uh, foreign aid. Um, <laughs> but uh, as a percentage uh, of the amount of money that uh, the Department of Defense has spent uh, foreign aid um, and these other international programs have gone way down. Mm -hmm. um, and we're spending uh, this year, we're on, uh, on track to spend three quarters of a trillion dollars on defense. 
why isn't reducing defense spending to uh, fund some of these other programs? My old boss, uh, Bob Gates, uh, famously uh, did a handshake deal with Secretary of State Clinton to give her $200 million basically out of the change between the uh, cushions on the sofa in his office <laughs> in the E-ring. I mean, what sort of world do we live in? And you're telling me that uh, the problem is retrenchment? The problem isn't retrenchment because we haven't retrenched in terms of the big ticket items uh, in terms of the uh, federal international, uh, international budget, which is defense yeah. spending. So, so I'd, I'd love to uh, take some of that money uh, and spend it on AID, spend it on um, uh, state, uh, maybe spend more on the intelligence community. I just don't think we need to spend as much on uh, the military as we are, are we so, Are we retrenching? Yeah. You know, hard yeah. power, yeah. So we, we, we absolutely have. So the trend line for both military and civilian budgets is going down. Civilian is going down faster, right? So they've both been going down quite a bit since 1988, right, since the peak of the Cold War. Um, the, the United States, since the end of the Cold War, uh, cut about uh, its military budget by about a third, uh, reduced its uh, armed forces by about a third, uh, all, com almost completely eliminated things like public diplomacy, uh, foreign aid, uh, uh, reduced its intelligence budget quite a bit, withdrew three quarters of its troops from Europe, about half of its troops from East Asia, uh, decommissioned three quarters of its nuclear weapons, unilaterally disarmed ourselves, destroyed our own chemical weapons stockpile. So we have consistently uh, reduced our own hard power over the past 30 years. And again, the Iraq war was a fairly temporary and minor blip up and then it's back down again. So we have, we have significantly withdrawn our hard power. Now you said, could we not take some of that and give it to uh, development aid? My, my view is they both need more. We, we need more in both. I don't no, know we, quite we, what the magic we, number is. Let me, let me ask yeah. you why we need more. Less I missed it, between 1989 and uh, 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 1993, the Cold War ended, we basically came out on top, and the Soviet Union fell apart. Is it your proposition that there should not have been any drawdown in either the amount of money we were spending uh, on forces or their deployment overseas? We won. <laughs> Uh, what I observe is that during the 1990s, I mean, are you happy with how the United States performed around the world after that drawdown? I, it sounded like you were pretty critical of the performance of U.S. foreign policy. So I think we would have done better if we had not cut back so much. Uh, I'll also say, right now, the defense budget, although you cited a very large figure, is the smallest as a percentage of GDP since 1939. The United States has the smallest military establishment it's had as a proportion of its economy since before World War II and the smallest military footprint around the world since essentially since we sent troops to Africa in 1941. So that's where we are now. That's what retrenchment looks like. Now you're saying do we need do we need more? Well, I look at the behavior of Russia, I look at the behavior of China, North Korea and Iran, and I say, okay, maybe the Cold War ended, but we are now in an era of great power rivalry with nuclear armed states and uh, terrorists, slavers, drug cartels, organized crime, and so forth. So yes, I think we need more tools to combat all of this array okay, of enemies. So there's a, a famous um, uh, illustration that many people uh, 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 suggest to uh, put in context uh, how militarily dominant the United States is. Uh, and I'm not sure as of uh, 2020 exactly what the numbers are, um, but I believe that the United States spends more uh, than at least the next 15 countries around the world on military forces. Um, and that if you were to add up just the raw numbers, the beans, uh, that we would have, uh, except maybe in military manpower, uh, larger forces than uh, certainly uh, all of our potential peer competitors. And that's not at all talking about the uh, qualitative advantage uh, that the United States has uh, over many of these other countries. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a realist, and I think that we may be moving back into a uh, more multi polar world uh, in which, uh, you know, uh, a great power competition once again becomes a, a factor of international politics. But if you're asking me to uh, bet on China or Russia uh, 
and I'm not even going to talk about Iran or North Korea, these are pygmies, uh, in terms of uh, who uh, has the most effective military uh, force in the world, uh, you know, every day and twice on Sunday. It's the United States. So this image that we've retrenched uh, just doesn't accord with the reality uh, of the world that we live in, uh, which is the post-Cold War world, and also what other countries have done. You want to talk about retrenchment, uh, talk about what the, uh, uh, Russia did um, you know, from the early 1990s until relatively recently. They went... So can you just address the, the military, and I'll, I'll throw in one more, and then I'm going to want to move away from the retren retrenchment, but I want you to defend that. The other is, before 9-11, we had over a million U.S. troops deployed outside of the United States. So... Um, uh, in the 80s we did, not, not in 19... Yeah. So it, are, did we really retrench, considering that our military is spending more than at least the next 10 countries combined on, on defense yeah. spending? So, so again, just looking at the trend lines of the actual dollar spent, it's been going down, or the, the, as a percent of GDP, it's been going down. And in nominal terms, it was going down until 9-11 blipped up a little bit. Um, so yeah, I do, I do call that retrenchment. Now, why is the United States military so much bigger than all the other countries uh, combined? Um, it is because the U.S. military tries to do things that other militaries in the world generally don't try to do. Right? We try to posture ourselves to deter enemies in multiple theaters. Nobody else tries to do that. But we also do something else. Uh, let me give you an example. There's something called Task Force 151. It's a naval task force off the coast of Somalia that fights pirates. Uh, so it didn't exist what, 10, 15 years ago. There was a big problem with Somali piracy. Anybody see the movie Captain Phillips? Right? That's where that came from. Lots of problems with Somali piracy. Now, who was going to take that on? Was it going to be the Somali Navy, the Saudi Navy, the Yemeni Navy, the Djiboutin Navy? Well, no. They all waited around and didn't do anything until the United States essentially volunteered to organize a posse, like the Old West. And the deputy says, OK, you, 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 come here. Right? And so we organized a multilateral posse against piracy. <clears throat> Only we can do that because only we have the resources. It means we've got to spend a whole lot of money on overhead, on logistics, intelligence, command and control, uh, communications, uh, and so forth, that nobody else has. And it costs a lot of money for us. But at the end of the day, it served the whole world. There's a whole lot less piracy off the, off the coast of Somalia. That's a small example of why we, have, why we have a larger military that costs more money than anybody else. We're trying to do more things that cost a lot of money and filling services that nobody else does. This segues perfectly into what I wanted to ask, which is, doesn't the United States have a unique role to play? Um, the, so the, 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 when you listen to what the popes have said about foreign policy, they always have a supranational supra view. In other words, Christianity was very explicitly something that was worldwide. And our history has always been to look at all of Christendom as something that's bigger than the nation state. And when I listen to the Pope's talk, you know that they, they wish that the United Nations was this force that could sort of be this, this global uniting force for good. United Nations is not a Christian entity. <laughs> It's a corrupt entity. And so in, given that reality, isn't there a role for the United States to be the posse organizer? We're the good guys. You know that, that comedy skit where the guys with the skulls and crossbones are like, maybe we're the baddies? When, when we look around, it's like, yeah, we made mistakes, but maybe we're the good guys. I, isn't it our job to be the, the, the posse organizers? Well, it, it seems to me there are uh, two issues here. Um, the you know, more concrete issue is whether without U.S. leadership these public goods uh, won't get provided. Um, and I think that there's uh, plenty of evidence that uh, uh, because the United States provides various public goods, other countries underprovide uh, what they should. I mean, this has been the story about uh, NATO defense spending going well back uh, into the, uh, to the 1950s. Instead of worrying about welfare cheats, we should be worrying about Germany not spending enough yeah. on defense. I, now, the, the more difficult question, and you're trying to sort of paint me uh, into a corner, Tim, and I'm not resisting going into this <laughs> corner. I, I believe, it's a well-painted corner. Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe America is a very good country. Um, and I believe in American exceptionalism. 
Um, but also, I don't believe that uh, we're as good, uh, at least in the eyes of a lot of other people, uh, as we think we are. And what I learned from St. Augustine uh, was to uh, understand that uh, even uh, you know, people with the best of intentions can sometimes do very bad things. Uh, and I worry a lot uh, when we pat ourselves on the back um, and uh, tell ourselves how good we are, whether in fact uh, we aren't in, uh, guilty of the sin of pride. Um, and I say that again, saying we're probably less guilty of it uh, than a lot of other great powers in the past, but nonetheless, it's a reality. And a reality, I think, that uh, those of us coming from a Christian frame ought to uh, be sensitive to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I think that's actually one of the better arguments for why we should seek to bind our power within a liberal order framework. Because without liberal order, what will American power turn into? I think it probably will turn into an empire. Uh, constraining our power within the norms of liberal order means that we're often going to be hypocritical and unfair, but at least we will have standards to hold us accountable and other people in the world to say, you're not being fair. And that will challenge us to do better and to try to restrain our power and use it for the common good. So on the question of hypocritical, another Catholic idea is a, the problem of cooperation in evil and um, whether it uh, be we uh, allied with Stalin during the Cold War, we had lots of unsavory friends. And sometimes the people who were pro-American, they were unsavory enough that we threw them overboard. Maybe that was a mistake. And then certainly in the, in the war on terrorism, and currently, Saudi Arabia is an ally. So I'm, I'm a journalist. We get to like say these guys are bad and these guys are good. The US government doesn't necessarily get to sort people that way. You need to have allies. So to what extent? Um, how do you think about the cooperation in evil if we are supporting these governments um, such as Saudi Arabia or, or Stalin or, or you know, during the Cold War, the various allies we have? Does, if we're Christians, are we more limited in the alliances we're able to make than if we're just realpolitik players trying to advance American interests? <laughs> it's, it's a harder question for you, so we'll start with you. Yeah. It's, I mean, a hard, it's a harder question for me. I think it is, yeah. Uh, well, I think it's a harder question not only um, you know, for uh, secular statesmen uh, of goodwill, um, but also uh, for the clergy. And think about the uh, situation um, that the uh, uh, last interwar and uh, uh, wartime uh, Pope, Pope Pius XI and Pope Pius XII uh, faced in terms of uh, dealing uh, with uh, the rise uh, not only of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, but the ongoing threat uh, of Stalin's Russia as well. Um, and what would you say to, uh, you know, to, uh, to Pius XII? Would you say um, that uh, you need to take a strong stand uh, against all these uh, uh, evil actors, even if it means that uh, you know the uh, the Holy See uh, would be uh, uh, overrun uh, by the uh, Nazis or the Italians. Or would you uh, admit that uh, there's a prudential element that even uh, people of uh, faith and uh, moral concern um, can, uh, you know, can make a, a, a reasoned decision. And I think I'm not a big fan of Winston Churchill, but I am a big fan of uh, his famous line uh, when he came under uh, criticism um, in the uh, uh, Houses of Parliament uh, for aligning with the Soviet Union after June of 1941 when he said, if Hitler invaded hell, I would have uh, made at least a favorable <laughs> reference uh, to the devil in the House of Commons. I mean, that's the reality of the world that we live in. And, and what I love uh, about St. Augustine was that, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, the effort to uh, think about uh, how Christians would navigate a world that would require um, those sorts of compromises while always keeping the eye on the prize. And the eye on the prize 
was not the perfection uh, of the city of God on earth, but it was the achievement uh, of the true city of God in heaven. Yeah, I, I think I mostly agree. I think that um, alliances with autocratic powers are um, permissible under exceptional circumstances, but it should be exceptional, and you should re review them regularly. You know, I think the alliance with the Soviet Union was necessary. You know, I think a lot of what we did in the Cold War probably wasn't. I think our relationship with Saudi Arabia today is, is sort of indefensible. I don't really support that at all. Uh, and I think we can see democratic powers as natural partners because we see the world the same way. We have the same values. Uh, partners, if not allies, you know, we have formal alliances with many of them, but even democracies that don't, aren't formal uh, treaty partners, we can still see as just, um, again, uh, there's a natural kinship there. Uh, so that's an easy map of the world right there. Sometimes we have to, but uh, ally, ally with autocratic powers, but we should, it should be exceptional justification. All right, now I'm gonna throw in the wild card, in particular because we have the, the tote bag there. Can you hold it up? It says, ban nuclear weapons. Now this is not just one tote bag. This is basically what the Holy Father says, um, that previous popes have talked about nuclear warfare being uh, immoral, but Pope Francis has said that nuclear deterrence and the possession of nuclear weapons is not fitting with, with Christian teaching. I want both of your responses on that. Paul first. So, um, yeah, thank you. This is a great question, and uh, I've one that I've sort of gone back and forth on over the years. Uh, I did uh, have a, written a book on just war theory. It's not out yet, uh, but fingers crossed it'll be out late this year, early next year. So I've written about nuclear weapons, and I read a lot by Paul Ramsey, a uh, Protestant theologian, mid-20th mid century, who wrote a lot on nuclear weapons. And uh, I think I mostly agree with his conclusion, uh, which was, uh, if, 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 I'll just state it as mine instead of trying to characterize him. Um, Counterpopulation, nuclear warfare, is intrinsically immoral. It is a tool of genocide. It's absolutely evil. Deliberately so, targeting non-military Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, so, and so to the extent that that is built into our nuclear doctrine or nuclear weapons, it's absolutely wicked and wrong. I will carve out a space for counterforce nuclear deterrence, where we are using our weapons to target other nuclear weapons or installations or large military formations, big tanks or aircraft carriers. I think those can be used, especially smaller nuclear weapons, can be used with proper discrimination and proportionality and thereby pass the just war test. So uh, I was at uh, the Vatican um, in November of 2017 when the Pope made his you know, most explicit statement um, you know, condemning nuclear deterrence. Um, and. Uh, uh, I guess as a believing Catholic, can you say you disagree with the Pope? I don't believe he spoke ex cathedra. So. <laughs> what we say is we prayerfully considered his comments. I, uh, I did, I did. Uh, I, I like being a Protestant. Yeah, and uh, so I wrote a, uh, a piece that uh, Commonweal, um, a uh, uh, sort of left of center um, journal of uh, lay Catholic opinion, uh, uh, published uh, arguing for the uh, morality of, uh, of nuclear deterrence. And of course, my uh, uh, colleague, uh, Jerry Powers, um, who's uh, closer to the Pope, uh, took me to uh, task in a, uh, a rebuttal on it. But my basic argument was very similar to the argument that the French and German bishops made during the Cold War, which is there's a difference between deterrence um, and nuclear use and uh, that I advocate uh, nuclear deterrence. Uh, I hope, well, I believe nuclear deterrence is rebut, robust, um, and I would hope that uh, it will never uh, be tested. Now, I get a little bit nervous um, when I hear people uh, who argue that uh, the, we can think about um, using nuclear weapons in a, uh, just war framework uh, if we don't target populations, but rather we target uh, the other side's weapons. Um, I, I don't buy that distinction. The evidence is pretty much overwhelming that a major counterforce strike against Russia, for example, uh, or China uh, would inevitably involve uh, significant uh, civilian casualties. Uh, worse, it's not clear um, that if we uh, uh, attack just 
uh, the strategic systems uh, of those two nuclear powers that they would restrict uh, their retaliation uh, just against our, our own system. So the whole idea of fighting nuclear war, uh, I think, pushes the bounds uh, of just war theory uh, further than I think it should go. And that's why I emphasize nuclear deterrence. Well, so two things. We're, I'm going to follow up on this, but I want to implore all of you Think of your questions. If you have a question, think of how to make it as concise as possible so we can get to as many as possible. But I want to come to a couple more questions here. Um, isn't there a difference, though, between um, collateral damage and directly targeting civilians? Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the collateral damage argument was pretty weak. We were trying to wipe out cities. But if there, we do use a nuclear strike against forces, and it creates collateral damage. Well, that's always been part of war. And so isn't it sort of in a different moral category than a nuclear attack on, on non-military forces? I think the biggest problem uh, for the project of Catholic realism that I'm uh, trying to uh, uh, reinvigorate I'm not laying it out, I think it's there in the tradition, is precisely the, uh, the question of intentionality. Because a lot of uh, realism is about unintended consequences. Yep. Uh, or the salutary, salutary consequences of you know, behavior that in an individual uh, would not be uh, you know, particularly praiseworthy. Nonetheless, I think it makes uh, a big difference uh, how many people uh, are killed. And I'm persuaded uh, that a nuclear exchange uh, between even relatively small nuclear powers uh, would be catastrophic for the people involved, and if it was the United States and Russia for uh, a lot of the world. Uh, and whether people in, intended only to uh, limit a, uh, uh, an exchange uh, to the military forces of each side is immaterial because I think uh, the evidence is overwhelming uh, that that would be impossible to do, even with the purest of intentions. Um, and so uh, I, I, I have problems with the intentionality argument. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think that uh, the question here is about proportionality, right? Yes, collateral damage is a reality of warfare, always has been, and it is with every weapon system. Nuclear weapons are not different in that sense. Um, and you have to ask yourself, is the good you're trying to achieve with a nuclear weapon worth the larger collateral damage that will likely result up from it? You mentioned Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, 250,000 civilians dead, but it also ended the greatest war in all history. So that's a hard call. I, I don't actually know what I think on that yet, but I, I don't think it's easy to dismiss just because it killed a lot of civilians. The effect it achieved was good. It affected a good, a good effect. Right? I mean, and again, in, in Christian ethics, in Catholic teaching, the idea that you can commit an objectively evil act to accomplish a good end is not something that the Catholic Church at all, in general, has smiled upon. Lots of Catholic scholars have, have yeah. supported the, the, well, the nuclear, but I the wouldn't, Japan. I wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize it as an, what do you call it, objectively evil act. I yeah. just wouldn't characterize it that way. If it's an act of war and you're trying to kill the enemy, and there is known foreseeable collateral damage that's going to happen, I don't call that objectively evil. Uh, it's a prudential call about how much collateral damage is going to happen, um, and we have to uh, use our judgment as we can. I, I have a little bit different take. I mean, I, I think that the, uh, you know, the debate about the morality uh, of uh, urban attacks during the Second World War began well before yeah. Hiroshima yep. and Nagasaki. Um, and it did involve a debate, um, certainly in Europe, between uh, the U.S. Air Force um, that believed in precision bombing uh, versus uh, the British, um, who were basically willing to carry the war in the most brutal fashion uh, against uh, German civilians. Now, what happened to us when we uh, shifted the uh, air campaign to the Japanese uh, I don't know, but we conducted um, mm -hmm. uh, conventional bombing using, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, incendiary bombs with the uh, clear intent of killing 
large numbers uh, of civilians. And I think that uh, Catholic thinkers like John Ford, a Jesuit, uh, were rightly, rightly critical of that. But I, I don't think that the uh, issue is uh, it, neatly separable into conventional, uh, precise, nuclear indiscriminate. Uh, it's more complicated, I think. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna open it up for questions. We have a microphone. Um, where, uh, and we'll, uh, where, sorry, where is the mic right now? Um, so let, let's start on, on this side of the room and we'll progressively uh, make our way over there. So uh, please wait for the mic, introduce yourself, and make your question sound like a question. Okay. <laughs> hold, hold the microphone pretty close to your mouth. Thank you. I'm Nicholas Dumovich. I direct the Intelligence Studies Program here at Catholic University. And my question is about the special case of covert action which is special because it's the implementation of foreign policy uh, initiative of the president in such a way that the hand of the United States is either hidden or we lie about it, plausible denial. Uh, whether and how this is consistent with Christian ethics. That's a great question, thank you. Lying, good or bad? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I served in the CIA for a number of years uh, as an analyst, nothing more. Um, so I Do had you occasion... now have to kill all of us? Yeah, now that's that you right. Told yeah. Yeah. Close the doors. <laughs> uh, so I had some occasion to think on this, study it, and actually get a little bit up close with it um, to see what it's going to be like. I, I don't think it's that different from normal foreign policy. Covert action is just foreign policy done in secret. And it doesn't actually have to be done by the CIA. Any agency can do it. Uh, so I think the normal rules of, of morality and ethics and just war theory can apply. If it's just to, to kill, it certainly is just to lie and, and steal and, and spy. Um, so I, I guess that's the framework I'd use to bring to it. I don't think it's especially troubling when you're trying to do things in secret, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I think Aquinas said that it was licit um, in certain circumstances uh, to lie to an adversary. So I think... Uh, the doctors of the church, um, you know, have uh, addressed that issue. Um, I, I have a former colleague and good friend, Jim Olson, who was a long-term um, CIA DO guy, um, and he wrote a very thoughtful book um, on the uh, morality of covert action, uh, fair play, which uh, I, I commend to you. I know uh, Jim, and I, I know. Uh, the depth of his commitment to uh, reconciling, you know, what he did for the country with his uh, religious faith, and I think that uh, the the book is a uh, a terrific meditation uh, on the challenges, but also uh, how these sorts of operations can be conducted in a justifiable way. All right. Just, just to piggyback, um, I, I'll go further and say about espionage in general. I would actually make the statement, I think it's probably wrong to spy on our allies. It's a foolish waste of resources, but I think it's actually intrinsically wrong. If you've made a partnership with another country, um, it is a, you said it's licit to deceive enemies. I, I agree with that. Is it licit to deceive your friends? No, I, I don't think it is. And so I would, I would say it's probably wrong to spend resources on espionage uh, for partner countries. But we countries. kind of do that. Yeah, I, yeah, and I, and, I think it's wrong. I think it's and, wrong. We shouldn't do it. Well, yeah. and our friends uh, spy on us as well, too. I mean, you know, well, first of all, Angela Merkel, I'm sure, has traded right. in her, her, old uh, cell, her phone, yeah. cell phone for uh, yeah. something a little bit harder. But uh, it's well known that one of our closest allies, the Israelis, Israelis. Uh, are one of the most aggressive yep. collectors, um, you know, in terms of... That doesn't make uh, it right. <laughs> and so now that you said the magic word, we're going to spend the whole rest of the time talking about Israel. <laughs> no, I'm joking. We're going to move down to a question, but I, I also will say that uh, this Catholic University has a Columbus School of Law which produces lawyers. So if you're worried about professionally lying, the spies in this room are not in the, in the biggest there trouble here. So, yes. I'm Charles McLaughlin. I'm a visiting fellow here, and uh, I work for the government too. So, for the sake of the recording, this is, this is only my thoughts. It has nothing to do with the government. The, um, but for Dr. Miller, I want to challenge you a bit on your thoughts on the, your defense of the liberal international order, because it seems to me that oh, we're out of time. What you're, <laughs> what you're describing is a history, not the current state, and, and I don't mean the current state because of this administration either. That liberal international order was established when we had 50% of the world's GDP when we could afford international institutions and multinational banks and other elements of the 
uh, structure of the international liberal order that were essentially oriented so that we did not get our fair share from them. We paid more than we got in because we believed in how it was going on. But it was also set up at a time when there was uh, the Soviet Union and we were trying to organize the free world against the Soviet Union. Neither of those conditions exist anymore. And many of those organizations operate in ways that are antithetical to our interests directly. The, um, so for instance, the World Bank um, actively supporting the development of China's Belt and Road and, uh, and also s funneling American tax dollars to Chinese companies in order to support the projects around the world. The, um, so how, so when you're talking about the liberal inter international order that we ought to have, is it the current one, which I think is a bit of an anachronism and works against us, is structured against us, um, or is it some future version of an international order that deals for the reality of today? Yeah. No, thank you. That's a, that's a challenging question. Um, the, the best answer I can give you is um, what I'm most interested in defending is a liberal international order, right? the idea of it, the aspiration of it. Right? That's what I think is almost, um, so it's obviously true, and right, that's, that's how I think of it. And it is the aspiration that helps us critique ourselves where we are today, and uh, it challenges us to do better. Right? Now, are there flaws in the existing, actual existing international order? Absolutely. And it's by looking at the ideal that we can figure out how to get better, how to revise, adapt, where to invest and improve, and where to maybe sometimes divest. Right? We didn't talk a whole lot about the Middle East. That's one area where I am in favor of a bit more retrenchment, because I think there's not a whole lot of opportunity to do good there. Uh, I don't know about the World Bank thing, uh, so maybe that's an institution that we should step back from if it really is working against our interests. But I'm, my, my argument, what I'm most keen on is holding out the ideal as our pole star to guide our actions, and that way we would know what to do uh, in the particular cases. So um, you had asked me a question um, at the beginning. I was going to wait till the end, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop the cue on this about um, uh, the system that the United States has had over the past 75 years, which you know I, I think uh, uh, almost everybody would say uh, was appropriate for the Cold War and played uh, some role in the uh, happy outcome uh, of the Cold War itself. Uh, but again, the Cold War uh, is over, uh, and we live in a, a new world. Um, you sort of have an image, I don't want to caricature this, but for the sake of poetic license, I will, uh, uh, of uh, the recreation of uh, the Bretton Woods system, maybe the European Union, maybe NATO, you know, all of these uh, pillars uh, that I'll admit at a, a certain period of time uh, were, you know, did good and uh, contributed to, uh, to peace and stability. But there's sort of a, uh, and I thought uh, Charles's question sort of um, hit this right on the nail. The liberal order also has become both tired and in a way less relevant to the world um, that we're living in today. And so as an exercise in nostalgia, uh, it makes sense. But in terms of being able to recreate uh, you know, the, the, the Bretton Woods moment, uh, the EU moment, the UN moment, wh you know, whatever your favorite moment was of the Cold War liberal order today, uh, you know, sort of stretches the uh, you know, credibility that we could really actually do that in this world that we live in. Be nice if we could, but, uh, you know, every time you see, <laughs> every year at Davos, the disconnect between Davos man and the rest of the world becomes more and more apparent. And, and I don't think that uh, that's something that we can just re recreate. And I also think that Davos man is uh, somewhat complicit um, in the fact that uh, he or Davos women uh, are no more relevant or no longer as relevant. Yeah, go do you, ahead. Do I, yes or no? If, if, if you got something to say, say it. That was kind of towards you. He, he addressed your question of the last 75 yeah. years. So. so I don't think that the liberal order existed only as a tool of containment. 
right? In, in 1950, when Paul Nitze wrote NSC 68, he actually wrote in there, he said, we would do this anyway, even if there were no Soviet Union and no Cold War. We would build these institutions and build this liberal order, because this is good, right? The liberal order, I think, is intrinsically just, separate from the particular world circumstances it happens to serve. Because? Right? Uh, because of the ideals, because of its fairness, because of its equality. It is a good system for ordered liberty among nations, right? It is ordered liberty among nations implemented in particular institutions, and that's, that's justice itself. Um, however, I will also say it's instrumentally good in the 21st century. Cold War is over, but we have a great power competition. We have Russia, China, and also North Korea, Iran. The liberal order today is a pretty good tool for handling those threats as well. So I'm saying both intrinsically just by its ideals and instrumentally good because of the challenges we face today. All right, we're going to uh, keep moving down this way in the, in the aisle here. Sorry, we're not going to be able to get to to every question, but... I'll talk even faster. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Will Barto. I'm a student here at Catholic U. I have a question for the man at the end. So you said that um, uh, giving more foreign aid and having a greater influence around the world is not imperialist on the U.S.'s part. Um, however, as we see China uh, greatly expanding its influence in places like Africa in particular, uh, where a lot of the countries there are indebted to China, and um, as such, China has the greater influence in organizations such as the UN. Uh, how is, how would the U.S.'s, um, or in additionally, uh, influencing, uh, influence that the other countries around the world be unlike that of what China is doing currently? How are we different from China? Yeah. Oh well, yeah. Well. I, and I from mean, from the question of, of Christian, like we're we're all Americans, we can be like, yeah, we're the good guys, yeah. but. To what, from Christian teaching, to what extent are, are we different in our foreign aid, in using foreign aid to advance our own interests? Why is that not just selfish in the same yeah. way China's is? Well, I mean, earlier this evening, Mike, you said that you, you believe in American exceptionalism uh, and that on the balance we've been more good than bad. We've been a force for good in the world. I, I think that's generally what my answer is going to be, is that um, because of the liberal ideals that inform the American experiment, because of the story we tell ourselves about the good guys we want to be, even though we often fall short, those ideals inform the, the way we interact with the world when we do it best. Like, obviously, we fail. We're hypocrites sometimes. But when we do it best, our actions around the world, how we treat other countries, um, is informed by those liberal ideals of equality and fairness. And that's what makes us different from Russia and China and other, and other powers. Yeah. That's why the liberal order buys its own new stakeholders. Other countries, look, Germany and Japan were avowed enemies and fascists and imperialists in 1945, and now look where they are today. That's the, the logic of liberal order building, is it, um, it builds new allies, new stakeholders. So let me ask you a question. So I, I got to know former President George H.W. Bush pretty well, um, and uh, he was a big fan as many you know, sort of uh, Republicans were um, in the uh, 80s um, and uh, early 90s uh, of trying to engage uh, China uh, in the uh, major institutions uh, of the uh, liberal international order, uh, you know, the WTO. Um, but, you know, there was also, I think, uh, an assumption uh, based on good big L uh, liberal reasoning that uh, China could be made into a stakeholder. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think there was a good faith effort um, by these folks that failed. Um, and why it failed, uh, I think, is uh, important uh, to think about in terms of uh, the, our ability to uh, preserve uh, the liberal international order and bring about uh, a lot of these good things that I wish would come about. We tried with China, yeah. uh, and it failed. Uh, we tried with Russia, although I think uh, our expansion of NATO worked at cross purposes with some of the other things that we did. We've tried this, um, and uh, it's run aground. So uh, how can you, it doesn't work, or it hasn't worked in two big cases, um, and uh, it seems to be at cross purposes now with your argument that we've got to treat Russia and China as great power rivals um, and uh, uh, 
you know, uh, the, the zone of freedom is going to somehow exclude them. Well, so in the 1990s and on up actually through today, we've been trying to foster economic liberalization in China without political liberalization. And I agree with you, it was a mistake and it's failed. Uh, and it's actually enriched and empowered a strong totalitarian autocratic China that is now uh, the foremost you know, authoritarian power in the world. So I, I think we're seeing eye to eye on this. Um, when I think of what the, liberal, the map of the liberal order, you can think of sort of overlapping uh, maps. You know, there's the map of political liberalism, map of economic liberalism, maybe the map of, of international institutions. So it's thicker in some places and thinner in other places. China just barely participates in economic liberalization. It cheats, it steals intellectual property, it does cyber theft all over the place. So it's, it's a, almost, a, almost a rogue actor in uh, the economic sphere. Um, so I don't, I, don't, I don't feel the need to treat them with kid gloves or treat them as if they are full so, stakeholders. Some of the argument the I remember from this time was when we trade with them, the, the argument is, the, the liberal argument is countries that trade don't go to war. And yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It was the Kantian tripod. tripod. There were three elements to it. The, you know, the, the, we believed... Classical liberals believed that uh, free trade uh, was inseparable from uh, mm -hmm. political uh, democracy or republicanism, and that the argument for uh, engaging China was the belief that you know they may not be so democratic now, uh, but we're going to enmesh them in the institutions mm -hmm. of global governance, and we're going to get them so hooked uh, on free trade. Um, that in good liberal fashion, uh, regime change is going to come along yeah. uh, inexorably. That's liberal. So this doesn't undermine your faith in the idea of the liberal economic order? Well, because that version of it is ultimately materialist. It says the foundation is economic, and if you just get the economics right, everything else will follow. It's a version of modernization theory. Look, we no, all know no, that's wrong. This is Immanuel Kant. This is German idealism. This is the classic argument uh, for the international liberal order. It has nothing to do with materialism. But to the extent that it emphasizes economics first and politics later, it is functionally materialistic. And I don't agree with that at all. I think the most important thing here are the, is the, the ideas, the norms of liberty and equality, the norms of ordered liberty. If that spreads, I think, I think that the rest will follow. I'm making an argument that ideas matter. Ideas have consequences. Ideas are the, the independent variable, right? Uh, that's, I think, the most important thing. All right, we're going to try to get a few more questions um, up front here because she wore the Catholic U sweatshirt. She gets the question. <laughs> so I wanted to thank all three of you for coming to speak to us today. And I type my question because I think the answer to it goes deeper than just the answer that will follow from it. And I actually especially, especially want to hear from you, Professor Miller. But um, with regard to nuclear weapons and assuming the position that America has a moral obligation to be a morally sound superpower in the world because arguably nobody else will, wouldn't you argue that having nuclear weapons is necessary as a safeguard for preventing other evil powers from using them first? And wouldn't you agree that it is necessary to advertise a power that deters other powers from wanting to use their own weapons like Iran? So if I understand the question, I think the answer is yes, I agree with that. But, yes, but, it all matters how you use those weapons, right? Um, because once again, uh, it would not be moral for us to use our nuclear weapons uh, for counterpopulation warfare um, or in ways that violate discrimination proportionality. E that's not worth it, even if it has a deterrent effect in other countries. Uh, Ramsey, again, said if it's immoral to threaten a thing, it's Im if it's immoral to do a thing, it's immoral to threaten it. Right? So it's, immor it's immoral to just bomb and murder civilians, so I'm not going to use my nuclear weapons to threaten that either. Um, but by and large, I think I agree with what you said. It's good for us to have the tools we need, nuclear or not, to deter our en enemies and rivals and opponents who want to harm us and harm our world. Uh, it's, it's good to deter them. Now, I'm not sure you agree that if it's, good to, if it's wrong to do a thing, it's wrong to threaten it. Do you agree? No, I, uh, and this is, you know, I debated John Finnis on precisely this point. I mean, Finnis thinks you can't bluff, you know, that uh, if you threaten to do something, you know, you're, you're basically, um, you know, uh, saying that you're going to do it no matter what. I guess he never played poker, but that's another matter. 
But I, I want to address uh, this young lady's point because I find myself in the uncomfortable position. On the one hand, uh, I don't advocate uh, nuclear disarmament. I think nuclear weapons have been uh, a force for uh, stability um, on balance. You had said, maybe you just misspoke, uh, uh, about uh, Iranian weapons. Iran has no nuclear weapons. They may have some nuclear weapons now that the uh, uh, Joint Comprehensive uh, Plan of Action, the uh, Iran uh, nuclear deal, uh, which we pulled out of, uh, is, uh, is falling apart. But uh, we have nuclear weapons, uh, the Iranians don't. Um, and I think it's very important when we're thinking about uh, the situation uh, of what a challenge Iran poses to us, that uh, they don't have nuclear weapons, they don't have much of a, a military at all. All right, a couple more quick questions. Yes, up here. Yes, sister. I've been with a lot of young people across this country lately, and they tell me they want a nuclear-free world, and they want to show you that this whole war making and nuclearism has caused, you know, this major use of fossil fuel, which is the major destruction of the planet. And I don't, I'm asking you the question, you know, does, does Jesus's life mean anything at all to you? I mean, does it mean anything to say thou shalt not kill does it mean anything to you? Love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. Does it mean anything what the Pope says as it relates to the environment, Laudato Si, and nuclear weapons? Does it mean anything to you to be part of building the better world, which all those folks at the UN try to do when they say, Every nation should disarm. When they say, that's what we're going to work for, I mean, are you going to become part of the younger generation that I'm listening to all the time that tells me a whole different story? I, I'm not I want to be... know your philosophy. I want to know what you want to do to make the better world. I want to know what you believe as Christianity. Well, I'm not going to become a younger person, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unless the... Let the Peter Thiel takes over. Yeah, the portrait of Dorian Gray <laughs> yeah. or something like that. <laughs> Sister, I don't believe in using nuclear weapons. Deterrence is not the use of nuclear it's weapons. It's threat to kill. It's not the use. That's, uh, that's very important. Second, se on. second, secondly, Sister, um, I believe uh, with you that uh, our heavy dependence uh, on fossil fuels uh, is imposing great harm on the environment. I also think that one short-term solution to that would be a reinvigoration of civilian nuclear power programs. If you want a carbon-free world relatively quickly, you would be an advocate uh, of building uh, uh, civilian nuclear power. Uh, it, it's sort of open and shut. Oh. Um, You've raised a, the, the classic case of, of pacifism, right? The Bible says don't kill, and Jesus says love your enemies. That's true. The Bible also says in Romans 13 that God has ordained that government exists and given it a sword so that the wrongdoer would fear it. Right? That is violent imagery, and it's clear that God, look in Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, he says to Noah, you know, um, um, uh, you know but he who sheds the blood of man by his will, by man will his blood be shed. By man will his blood be shed. God is commissioning humanity to keep order in the world. And what mechanism do we have to do that but government, which wields coercive force? So we do have to do that sometimes. Regrettably, we don't live in the, in the city of God. We live in the city of man where sometimes these things are necessary. All right. Um, now everybody uh, raises their hand. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry, uh, it's Professor Rin over there. I'm Klaus Rien, the director of CSS. I associate Christianity with uncompromising realism. You must not have any illusions about human nature. You must have modest expectations. Now back to 2004, 
on the occasion of the, uh, or the anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, David Brooks wrote a column in the New York Times in which he confessed that he had given in to what he called childish illusions as to what was possible in Iraq. And National Public Radio put on a program with people who represented the kind of mindset that got us into the war in Iraq. They had David Brooks, they had Mitch Dechter, and of course, Bill Crystal. And they were discussing their second thoughts. Now what I want to ask you about is, how could it be that this great country would be represented in foreign policy by people like that. <coughs> Crystal, Dector, Brooks, they were not literally making foreign policy, but people like them were. And who were they? They were people who had to learn elementary lessons, <laughs> really basic elementary lessons on the job. That is, it took them by surprise that things turned out so disastrously as they did in Iraq. What is the problem here? And this will be the, uh, the final question, so sneak in your final statement uh, <laughs> to that. So my f one of my favorite uh, Catholic writers is Graham Greene. Um, and uh, one of my favorite Graham Greene novels was The Quiet American. And one of my favorite characters in that novel was Alden Pyle. Alden Pyle was a good and decent uh, American. Uh, he believed in progress um, and he believed uh, that advancing America's interest um, and doing good were not in tension with each other, that they were mutually reinforcing. The tragedy of Vietnam was not that evil people uh, for self-interested or other uh, reasons uh, pushed bad policies. Uh, the tragedy of Vietnam, the tragedy of Iraq, the tragedy uh, of Libya is that the road to hell is often paved with good intentions. And I think an Augustinian view would alert us to that possibility. Um, and uh, I'm not sure uh, that we still have that uh, sort of realistic view of the world. The greatest tragedy of the war in Iraq will be if we use it as an excuse to lay aside all of our idealism. Uh, that will be the great, greatest um, casualty of the war. Uh, you said that we have to have modest expectations, but did the abolitionists have modest expectations? Did the civil rights movement have modest expectations when they envisioned a world that literally did not exist? No, they used their ideas to envision something better and challenge themselves and challenge the world around them for something better. Yes, we have to have a grounded, realistic appraisal of human sinfulness, but that is not the whole story, not even for Christians. We understand that all humans are made in the image of God, and they're and thereby we, are, we have the capacity for goodness, truth, and beauty. And that's the world we have to imagine if we're ever going to live in a better world. Reinhold Niebuhr said, nothing that is worth achieving can be accomplished in our lifetimes. And that is why we have to be saved by hope. Thank you very much. Pax Vobiscum. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. And, uh, uh, Professor Rin, can you, um, we'll, we'll grab the mic and tell you about... Uh, if I even need the mic, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Well, I just want to draw your attention to another upcoming CSS event in just over a week. We're going to have a debate between two very prominent and very different representatives of the, of the field of international relations. Patrick Porter and Robert Hayden, and their topic will be, welcome to the jungle, question <laughs> mark. And the issue is, international order after Trump. When is it going to be? February 18th, the time, 6 o'clock, the room, 
this very room. And now um, you are most welcome to help yourselves to uh, food and drink. But I think before we do that, I would like to thank the panelists for a wonderful discussion together. Thank you.